So you just spent the last few months growing some beautiful plants. You trained them right, you fed them good, you provided the best environment possible, and in the end you're left with some beautiful resinous buds that even your neighbor down the street could probably smell. The hard work is over though, right? It's time to pluck those suckers off and enjoy the fruits of your labor? Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but even if you did everything right while growing your plants, without a proper harvest and dry, all of your hard work might amount to nothing in the end if not done with care, patience, and consideration. Well, my friends, in this episode, I'll be going over my own harvest techniques that I practice, which I've found great success in over the years, and most importantly, ensures that all my hard work put in while growing my plants does not go to waste. I'll also go over the harvest results and announce which pheno that I ended up picking and why towards the end of the video. So when I say go to waste, what exactly do I mean? Well, if harvest is not done properly, you could experience the dreaded hay smell, bud rot, or a loss in terpenes, leaving you with some pretty buds with poor taste and smell. A proper dry and aftercare is a commonly overlooked aspect within the growing community. To me, it just doesn't make any sense to put so much time into our gardens without finishing them out in the best way possible. Now, before we chop down the garden, I think it's important to have the dry room or tent already set up and tested as one important factor to the drying process Process is keeping the environment as consistent as possible. The last thing you want to be doing is overcoming an issue with heat or humidity while your plants are already chopped down and within the space. I hate to say it, but the drying process isn't very forgiving. So I'll be opting to dry in a tent separate to my own grow space. Now the rule of thumb when drying is 60-60. That's 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 60% relative humidity. Low temperatures will help preserve terpenes as well as slow the dry time down, while slightly higher humidity levels will also allow for a slower dry overall, giving more time for the chlorophyll to break down prior to placing the buds into long-term storage. The name of the game is low and slow, and that's where patience really comes into play. To keep my temperatures cool, I use a portable AC which cools down my lung room in specific. I prefer to keep the AC out of my dry tent as it also pulls humidity out of the air which is something that I don't want while drying. To increase and maintain a constant RH level, I'll be using a humidifier. Airflow is also essential during the drying process, but not in the same application that we use it in our grows. You want to keep the air moving around, however, you don't want the fans directly aimed at the plants while they dry. Keeping the air moving helps reduce the chance of rot and promotes a more even consistent dry overall. I'll be placing a small oscillating fan towards the bottom of the tent to help move some air around. And I'm also placing a small clip-on fan towards the top of the tent, however, I angle it away from the plants and have it bouncing off the tent wall. Now I want to keep my extractor fan on to help reduce the smell during harvest, but I'll be turning it down on its lowest setting as I don't want it to to suck out too much humidity. Because I'm drying in complete darkness and not using my LED, the temps will be lower, meaning I won't need the extractor fan on full blast. To monitor the environment remotely, I'm using a Pulse One, which sends real-time historical data to my phone, so I know that the temps and relative humidity are on point without actually having to go into the tent and affect the environment. This isn't necessary to the process, however, makes things a lot easier for me in the long run. I'll leave links to it and every other product that I used in the video's description. Now, I'll be testing this room over the next two to three days, which will give me a rough estimate on how stable the environment is. It's also going to tell me if I need to make any adjustments prior to the plants going in. While I test the room, let's take a look at the plants and determine if they're ready to harvest as well as how to do so. Now some old school methods include going based off a of leaf fade and pistol color, however I prefer to check the trichomes as that'll give you a much more accurate representation of when the plant's ready to be chopped down. For checking the trichomes, I'd suggest either a jeweler's loop or even better, a USB microscope. You want to harvest when at least all of the trichomes on the plant have turned from clear to cloudy. And a lot of growers actually prefer to see some amber heads, for example 80% cloudy, 20% amber. Now where you check the plants matters. First off, it's important to check the calyx versus checking the sugar leaves. In my experience, the sugar leaves always seem to ripen faster, and in the end we'll be trimming most of those off. Another thing to remember is to not only check the top of the canopy, but to also check the mid and lower canopy as well, because the tops tend to ripen faster, meaning if you chop just based on the tip top trichomes, the majority could still be unripe, so it always pays to triple check. Here's an example taken from the top of the canopy of Pheno 2 and another from the mid canopy of the same plant. And lastly, the lower canopy, still the same plant.
you can see the top has a lot more amber. The mid is about 80% cloudy and about 20% amber. And the lower canopy has some amber, but it's still mostly cloudy. This is what I like to see, and this would indicate that the plants are finally ready to harvest. Now, I'm a big advocate on not only dry trimming the buds, which means that you wait till they're completely dry to trim, but also hanging the plant as a whole, meaning I chop the plant at its base rather than chop the branches individually. From my experience, the key to a proper dry is to extend the dry time as much as possible. For the average indoor plant, you want to be getting at least 14 days of dry, if not more. Now I understand that we want to sample these buds and reap the benefits of our hard work, but this is where a little bit more patience will make a big difference. Now once I get the plant hung up, it's more or less just a waiting game. I turn off the grow light, I fill up my humidifier, I zip up my tent, and really just let them sit as I don't want to disturb the environment. At around 10 days in, I'll hop in the tent and test the readiness by bending a branch between my fingers. Now if the branch bends easily without making any kind of snapping sound, I know the plant is still retaining too much moisture and is not ready to come down. What I'm looking for is an audible snapping sound, where the branch essentially cracks but does not break clean off. It's a method that's mastered with practice, but what you don't want to see is the branch breaking clean in half, which would be an indicator that the plant is too dry. There are some fancy moisture meters that you can use, however, I I prefer to do it the old school way, which is by hand. At day 16 into the dry, I finally achieved the desired result, and it was time to get the ladies down and start the trimming process. Now how much you trim is really up to you. I prefer a pretty tight trim on my buds, but at the end of the day you just want to pull off any large fan leaves. The sugar leaves can stay if you want, but I repurpose most of my trim for making edibles anyway. Now this process can be a little bit tedious, especially if you're going in for a tight trim, but thankfully I had some great help from my girlfriend and we ended up binge watching the new season of Stranger Things which helped pass the time. Some items that I'd recommend to make the process easier is to get yourself a decent set of plastic gloves as the process can get pretty sticky. Also pick up some denatured alcohol to soak your trimmers in between uses to help keep them clean. This will make the process that much easier. Now I prefer to do this work on a trim tray as it has a fine mesh screen which catches all the trichomes that end up falling off during the drying process. This helps minimize your waste overall. I'll end up passing this keef through another screen to further remove any remaining plant matter but as you can see on the first go it's pretty clean. For their long-term storage, I'll be using these sea vaults. I've been using these for the past few years now, and although they are a little bit of an upfront investment compared to some other options, I find the quality to be great and foresee these lasting me many years moving forward. It's always impressed me that even after opening up a jar after months, the RH is always spot on with what the Bravito Pack says on it. Speaking of the Bravito Pack, sea vault recommends to leave them out for a few weeks upon first jarring, but I will be placing in a hygrometer to monitor the RH. I use these ones by ink bird and they haven't failed me yet. Now thanks to the extended dry, the need for burping is greatly reduced if not needed at all at this point. I'll still be opening up the jars about once a week for the first few weeks to check in on them, but that is one of the greatest byproducts of a low and slow hang dry. The very first grow that I ever completed, I not only wet trimmed, but I also dried on a drying rack, and ever since I switched to this method years ago, I've never looked back. I'll be letting these buds rest for at least a month because like a fine wine, I find things get better with age. However, I was able to to sample each pheno, so let me go over my top three and finally reveal which pheno I chose as my keeper and why. Fino 1 is Sherbet Cookies tightened up quite a bit after a good dry. If you watched my last video prior to chopping this grow down, you would have heard me note their airy appearance. Now although I wouldn't consider this dense, I do think it turned out a lot better than I expected. The overall smoke was enjoyable, huge notes of pine are noticed not only in the smell, but also in the taste, which to be honest isn't my personal favorite. The effects were generally enjoyable, with my body experiencing a nice relaxing buzz, and it certainly gave me the giggles.
Now, Fino 2 was a well-rounded plant. Its yields were very impressive given the quality, the buds were nice and compact, and the trichome production was very respectable. There was a lot of similarities between this and Fino 1, as it was very piney on the nose as well as the taste, and the effect was overall enjoyable and very stony. Now, Fino 3 has a special funk to it. It had slight notes of pine, but mainly smelt like very stinky socks. The aroma is very powerful and in ways reminds me of the strained cheese. Its buds are rock hard dense and have a great overall structure to them, not to mention the resin production was by far the best out of any other Fino in the tent. The effects from its flower was a little more energetic in ways. It still had a very relaxing stony high, however one thing I really enjoyed about it was it didn't make me very tired. It was all the best effects of a classic indica, with just enough energy to stay awake to enjoy them. For these reasons alone, Fino 3, my mutated dwarf, will be my prized Fino that I'll keep around, and as you'll see here in the next few weeks, will be cloned and placed into two separate DWC grows where we can really put this Fino to the test. The grow overall netted me a little over a pound and a half of bud, not including trim, but the dwarf only contributed to about two ounces of that final weight. It was by far the weakest yielding strain out of the tent. I do feel like its small yields and slow growth can be negated in a DWC system where faster growth rates and larger yields are to be expected. Either way, it'll be a really fun experiment, and I'm stoked that the underdog of this whole season ended up being the number one choice in the end. If you guys enjoyed this video, please don't forget to press the like button and leave a comment for the YouTube algorithm. It's one of the best ways that you can support the channel. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below or even join our community Discord server where you can chat with me live. I'll be seeing you guys in the next video, which will be a fun cooking project. And as always, guys, happy growing.